Hello, my name is Stephanie Schober. I'm a solutions engineer here at Cardo. Hi, everyone. I'm Margara. I'm a product manager at Cardo. And retail subject matter specialists are starting to address what the retail world may look like with COVID-19 in the rear view mirror. In this slide, we're seeing a survey conducted by Dalai, who interviewed 50 retail executives and 15 retail subject matter specialists to address what are the priorities for CPG and retail in 2021. And these are trends CPG and retailers are identifying with. In this past year, I've seen a lot of questions surrounding these trends. One of the most discussed topics coming out of the pandemic is digital acceleration. Many retailers are heavily invested in digital capabilities and as such planning major investments in e-commerce, contactless capabilities, and store technology upgrades. A big trend in today's world is this unspoken rule in retail and pursuing new revenue models such as subscriptions, memberships, or forming new partnerships or alliances to create a profitable and digital omni-channel experience. CPG are encountering a trend commonly referred to as the digital shelf, and understanding with this comes to a direct-to-consumer approach. With this approach, CPG brands are undergoing a lot of pressure around sustainability and how to navigate these waters successfully. Many brands have navigated the e-commerce channel directly to the consumer, but with this, there are usually a lot of questions surrounding the supply chain and, of course, that final mile delivery dilemma. I suspect a lot of these key trends for 2021 are going to bleed into 2022. And they are all excellent questions, and we wouldn't be here today if there wasn't some sort of geospatial component to these big issues. And so in my presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these trends and provide a few geospatial solutions to address them. So let's dive right into digital acceleration. Retailers are beginning to understand this need to increase in digital-first technology. More and more retailers are considering huge investments on a physical location or transforming products with a digital first approach. Amazon being the biggie in this field created an alliance with Whole Foods to create up Amazon Fresh, where users can have groceries delivered with the click of a button. Another example I've seen here in NYC as well as in London is Taco Bell's digital first cantina. Ordering at this cantina is an exciting and experiential atmosphere. No human contact, order customization by the click of a fingertip and discovering which cubby will contain my order, it's a whole new look for this brand. And a lot of retailers are looking at MasterCard spending data to understand where are the most accepting digital audiences. MasterCard spending data can be broken down by spend types as shown in this example. Users can visualize consumer origins or trade areas. In this example, we're looking at a Boston airport and we're seeing one month worth of visitors by local origins. Another trend is supply chain resilience. We were all victims of the great toilet paper drought of 2020, but this is just one example of how crucial retailer supply chain needs to be remain agile in the demand of the market. Here we can see how location intelligence can play a big role in the supply chain in terms of understanding how a retailer's footprint is in relation to their distribution centers. In this example, a US supermarket is displaying their routes to distribution centers in relation to the overall demand of their locations. With this, retailers have to consider cost in that final mile delivery dilemma. Cost of number of hour on the roads, fuel, weight of the truck, size of the delivery, you name it. Routing a compact and effective supply chain has been a crucial trend for this year in retail. This next trend usually goes in tandem with another, but health and safety has been an important trend. I often see retailers looking to GIS technology to observe and analyze where people physically move around in an indoor space. Are there congregations of people? Are we putting our employees at risk? Are we successful at navigating social distancing norms? Here we're seeing an airport using geospatial technology to understand movement within the terminal. This airport is using technology to determine where more cleaning or maintenance should be a higher focus, or if there's a need to optimize for the retailers in the terminal to reduce foot traffic jams. You can see how flexible this technology could be for the user to engage in a mobile phone environment and visualize the airport layout and navigate their visit. Sustainability. A lot of CPGs are going under a lot of pressure to pursue sustainable investments. And one exciting example is when Philip Morris International. This collaboration is called Our World is Not an Ashtray. They're using Cardo to create algorithms and help understand where there's a greater propensity to drop cigarette butts so they can proactively go and collect this garbage. The science behind this algorithm brings in various different data sources, such as foot traffic, tourism metrics, and a wide range of data sets to predict trash fluctuations as tourism is going to begin to pick up in this new normal. Direct to consumer. 
These retailers have been popping up more and more and are considering store placement in terms of accessibility to their customers. For example, Amazon lockers are placing pickup locations around convenience stores throughout the US. Here in this map, we're analyzing where consumer audiences are and market penetration within a five or 10 minute walking distance from these convenience stores or delis throughout the London area. This will help determine which locations are best to roll out this new locker strategy. And with these big meaty issues, geospatial analysis is playing a key role in helping CPG and retail. But these problems, retailers are slow in seeking talented data science and analysts to perform these tasks or models. For industries like the financial services, they have been predominantly fast to hire and adopt data science protocols. In fact, most are doubling down on analytics when you compare them against other industries. Here we're seeing McKinsey's distribution of analytical roles in CPG on the top graph and below where CPG is falling in adoption to digital first technology. As you can see, there's plenty of room to grow. Here at Cardo, some of our biggest takeaways with CPG clients was surrounding education. We're seeing that one out of three data scientists actually know how to put their skills into action. They understand how to gain access into more resources or shopper insights. We're also seeing many brands rely on consulting firms to fill in the gaps of that data science talent. And one last commonality we see in CPG is that retail or GIS specialists are experiencing department silos in the workplace. And so the solution in our eyes is commonly found with our customers is the ability to equip data scientists or GIS analysts with the tools of very complex models, such as predictive analytics in the hands of business users. So today we're gonna to be demonstrating Cardo site selection tool. This is an application that's tailored fit to each client's needs or, at, or, or approaches. The application taps into third-party data such as spending, mobility, customer segmentation, and it's equipped with powerful machine learning models to better enable understaffed or underutilized teams with accessibility to deliver actionable insights into the hands of business users. And with that, I'll hand it over to Margaret. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, so the site selection uh, tool enables business users to view their current locations, understand the sociodemographics of the people visiting those locations, and most importantly, perform a series of spatial analysis powered by machine learning models, uh, such as, for example, white space analysis or finding twin areas or predicting the revenue or of, of a hypothetical new location. And these machine learning models are powered by some of our data sets from Cartos Data Observatory, but most importantly, they are tailor fit as well to the customer's business data. Uh, so in particular, they use three main input uh, data sets. One is the store locations, the second is the revenue, and third is the competitor's location. Uh, but let's have a look at the app. As you can see here, it's composed of uh, three main components. We have, of course, a map where we can visualize the data, in this case, our stores. Then we have on the right a set of uh, interactive widgets that are giving us certain indicators of the stores that we are seeing on the map. And then on the left, we have this other component that acts as a layer, uh, as a legend, sorry, and a, and a layer selector. Um, so as I was saying, one of the functionality of this application is that you can browse your, your store uh, your store locations. So if I zoom here, for example, I'm seeing that the all these widgets on the right are getting updated to show me a few insights about my stores. So I can see, for example, how many stores I have. I can see a disaggregation of the number of stores per category. In this uh, example data that we have, we have two simple categories. We have stores by type of location and also stores by type of the clothing that they sell. And I can also use these widgets to filter the information that I have on the map. So for example, if I want to see only the factory outlet type of stores, I can click here and I can see that the information gets filtered and I can narrow it down even farther to choose, for example, the ones that sell linen. And at any time I can of course clear these filters and then I'm back to my full set of, of the stores. Other things that you can see here are uh, stores by revenue. So you have the number of stores per, per revenue bucket. And you can see, of course, the store list. And also you can see the uh, total revenue uh, uh, aggregated by, by all of the stores that you can see on the map. In the same way that I can analyze the stores, you can also analyze your competitor stores. So if I zoom a little bit more, go here and activate the competitors layer. Uh, 
I'm seeing here like together with my stores, the competitors, and I can also, also see a set, of, a set of insights. I can see the number of them and I can also filter them by the category. In this case, for example, I can say, okay, only show me the medium sized uh, uh, competitors. Finally, I can do exactly the same, but with the POIs. So if I activate the POIs layer, I can also have all of these insights by, you know, total number of POIs of points of interest that I have uh, in terms of uh, all the different categories. So for example, if I only want to see the tourism one, I can just click here and everything gets, gets filtered. But now let's, let's uh, analyze a particular location. So if I click on this, for example, which is this clothes uh, natural store, what I can see here is actually the characteristics of the catchment area of the, of the store. And I can define this catchment area in different ways. The simplest way is just by an area defined by a, by a radius of a particular size. I can say, for example, okay, 500 meters or 1,000 meters. But I can also define this catchment area with more complex polygons, like, for example, the area that I can cover by driving a specific distance, for example, 500 meters or 250 meters. And I can do exactly the same uh, with driving time. So let's pick, for example, the area as my, as my catchment area, the area that I can cover driving uh, 10 minutes by car. So once I've picked my catchment area, I can start seeing all of these KPIs on the widget. So I'm, I'm seeing here, for example, all of the sociodemographics detail, how many people live in this catchment area, what's their median age, their gender and their age distrib distribution. I can see how many households live there, what's their education level. I can see things like their median age, even, even the income per capita and the income per, per household. And I can do exactly the same uh, for, with the competitors. I get also some insights, like the number of competitors that I have uh, here or the number of, of POIs. And as, as you could see, like you can also filter it by category and do this sort of analysis. Uh, so once, I've, once I'm happy with the analysis that I'm doing, uh, you, I can go ahead and click on download report. And this converts to a PDF that you can, of course, download and share with whoever needs to see uh, this report. Uh, but let me go back to my store. And let me show you what the first analysis. So the first analysis is based on finding similar areas to the one that I'm analyzing. So say, for example, that for, for whatever reason, I'm very happy with the performance of this store and I want to find similar areas. So similar areas that hopefully means that if I open a story in, in them, I'm going to get uh, a good a good business opportunity, a good amount of revenue, similar to this one, right? Uh, so I can do exactly that using the twin area analysis tool. And what I can do here is first of all, define the size of the area and then uh, narrow it down, narrow the search of my areas in a particular state. So let me pick Pennsylvania, the same state where we are. And then we can set like the number, the percentage of similarity that we are, we are interested in finding. And also I'm able to characterize or choose which are the, the parameters that I want to take into account during this search. So I want to find areas that are uh, close to the one that I'm, that I'm seeing right now in terms of demographics, POIs, my assets, so other locations around it, and also the competitors around it. And now what I need to do is just click on run. And the output of this analysis is going to be uh, the number of areas that fit uh, with this criteria. So as I was saying, a specific percentage of similarity and also a particular percentage of similarity in terms of, of all the different uh, parameters that I input. Um, so yeah, as you can see, if I disable this, you can see it more clearly. The, you can see with the black marker, that's my original area. And then you can see all of these other areas that are the ones that are similar to the ones that I'm, analyze, I'm analyzing. And here on the right, I have the full list of them with the percentage of similarity of, of each. And to browse them, I just need to click on one of them. I could, we could have done the same uh, using the map. And most importantly, what I can see is the predicted uh, annual revenue. So, which means that if I open a store within that area, I'm probably going to make around this particular revenue. Uh, and you know, it also besides the revenue, I can see all of the sociodemographics details that I could uh, see with, with the catchment area analysis. And to browse each of them, I can just use this uh, little component that allows me to one to go from one to the other.
Okay, so now let me show you a different analysis. Uh, let's go ahead and simulate the opening of a store. I'm going to close all of this. And now let's go to Chicago for that and let's simulate the opening of a store in the loop of Chicago. Uh, and in order to do that, what we need to do is to use the simulation tool. So I click this and then I have to place the marker in the location when I want, where I want to open uh, my new store. So for example, let's pick this one. I need to characterize it. So pick what's the category of it. Uh, pick, for example, a street type of shop that is going to sell uh, cotton. And then just give it a name and click on run. And this, the tool, what it will mostly is on the one hand, all of the characteristics of the catchment area that I was uh, analyzing earlier. So the 10 minute driving time. And also it's running a revenue prediction model that will give me the predicted annual revenue for that particular location. While this runs, I can also show you how you can analyze, of course, things about the competitors as previously and also the POIs. Okay, so this has, this has finished and it's telling me that if I open a store in this particular location, I'm going to make uh, a seven, around $7 million annually. So that's not bad at all. Um, let me uh, find, show you the final analysis, uh, which is the white space analysis. And this works a little bit differently because it doesn't take as input the location of, the, of, the, of an area or the location of a store. Instead, what it does is just analyzing the whole area. So in this case, the, the whole country. Uh, and let me show you how that works. It analyzes the full, the full country to let me know which are the areas of the biggest opportunity. So as we are now using like the annual uh, revenue as our su success metrics, what it's going to do is find the areas where I can make the most business. So with the, with the highest amount of revenue. So I'm going to make a search in New York. And you can set things like uh, the minimum uh, the minimum annual revenue that you're looking for, and also set whether you want to take into account the competitor's location or, of, or not. Uh, let me just call it a name and then run it. And while this finishes, I wanted to show you also this other section, which uh, is basically where you can check all of the previous analysis that you've done. So here you have categorized by type of analysis, all of the different results. So all of the analysis that you make are actually stored here, so you can check on them uh, later. Okay, and this, this analysis actually has finished the white, white space analysis. Going to load it so we can see the results. If I disable this, you see more clearly, you see uh, that it has found a set of areas in New York that represent a great opportunity, great business opportunity. So the ones uh, that are darker are the ones that have the, the highest uh, predicted revenue, uh, which is the, actually the one that we're seeing here on the right. So we are seeing for each of them the revenue and also all of the different insights, the sociodemographic insights. And in the same way with, as with the twin areas, I can also just click on them and see all the different results. So I can analyze which one I'm interested in and then, and then analyze it further. And I think that's it for me. Uh, I'm going back to the presentation uh, so Stephanie can wrap it up. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. And this application has been one exciting way Cardo has been a part of CPG and retail this past year. We've seen it in action serve business users to understand how analytics and data science can be a, an effective and convenient way to solve issues and geospatial problems. Uh, we can go into the next slide. And as restrictions are now being lifted, now is the best time to invest in a geospatial solution. So if you want to find out more about Cardo's tools, drop us an email or visit us in the Cardo virtual booth. Thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, I guess post them in, in the chat. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Steph and Margaret. We've got loads of questions, actually. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, so first of all, uh, Laura Narvaez, who asked lots of questions, uh, asked if this was like a global tool, and I, I've already said the answer this is available in multiple countries. One of the questions that came from Jacob John is how, how do you determine the isotope in the areas that are less than 10 minutes away by car? How do we do that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we, Carter has a set of APIs that are used exactly to do that. 
So we, we use like a model from, for example, TomTom or Mapbox that has all of the routing information. So then we can, we can do that type of analysis. So you can set, you know, by knowing all of the road network, then you can find exactly how long you can travel uh, through all the roads, you know, taking as origin your a particular location. So yeah, it's basically bottom bottom line is like using using Carto tools and Carto APIs that we of course have available. Fantastic. And on the income data, Tisha Sedev asked, uh, what are the source of, source of the income indicators in terms of data? So the data is also, you could also look at Cardo's data observatory. Cardo's data observatory has access to public, so freely available data sets, as well as premium data sets, which can, you know, a little bit off cost, but uh, it's really dependent on the user, on what they want to tap into, but feel free to explore that on Cardo's data streams. I don't know if we can post that link into the chat. Uh, some of it's going to be, I think for this instance, it's going to be the American Community Survey. Um, but you can go ahead and incorporate any kind of, you know, demographic from uh, Experian, uh, whoever it is that is your preferred vendor for your demographics. A uh, cool thing about this tool is we can customize it to, you know, whatever data sets that you want to be able to include into there. So if it's demographics, great. If it's consumer expenditures, great. We're happy to load this in and start to configure it towards your tailored fit model. Awesome. And on that note, Steph, um, Laura also asked a question about how often the data is updated, particularly because of how much revenues and costs can fluctuate in, in mm -hmm. right now. Uh, so what are the, poss the possibilities there? Right. So it's all dependent on the client and their needs. So it takes into uh, your historical revenue information. So if you wanted it updated monthly, weekly, yearly, annually, uh, quarterly, it's really dependent on the client's needs. The application can be as versatile as you want it to be uh, and as, as you have that information ready to go. Um, it, in terms of demographics and updates, that again is dependent on the client uh, and also the, the vendor, right? Most vendors only put out annual, uh, you know, such as demographics, but there are some vendors such as, you know, uh, some mobility providers that will do monthly, daily, weekly. <laughs> so it, it's all flexible. Um, it really just depends on what it is uh, you're looking to see. Uh, it will be as up to date and reflect the most accurate information as it can uh, in terms of what data sources are usable at that time. I hope that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, there's another question as well about the similar areas. How, how efficient is the similar, similar areas analysis? How similar, sorry, Flo, I can hear very well. How, how efficient is the similar areas analysis? How efficient in terms of what performance or? Yeah, I think the question is probably like, you know, what goes into the algorithm for mm -hmm. similar areas? Yeah, so actually what we do behind the scenes is like gridify or convert the whole world in grids and then kind of enrich each of these grids of a particular size with a lot of data. So because these machine learning models, you know, the more the more data and the more historical data, the better. What we do is just take all of the demographics data set, all of the POI data set, all, all of the customers data set and enrich those uh, um, those kind of little grid cells that, that compose the whole world. So behind the scenes, what we're doing is just comparing, you know, the grid cell where your where your store is or what the, or where you want to run the analysis, compare it with the rest of the grid cells, and then compute some sort of like similarity metrics. And everything is computationally very efficient, just because of you know how well we can partition the world in this way. Uh, so yeah, I think I think in, in terms of like computational performance, I think it's very good because you know you can parallelize these sort of algorithms very well. Um, and also we are using, uh, you know, BigQuery behind the scenes uh, and cloud native technologies to, to make it as fast and efficient as possible. Fantastic. Uh, I think some of the other questions have been answered in the chat by uh, Chavi, who's joined us. Um, but uh, another question uh, that's here is about the revenue prediction model. Is it based on a gravity model, uh, closest facility services? Um, could you just expand a little bit on how that works? So it will take oh, go ahead. No, it, go ahead. Will, it will take in historical revenue information. So your historical data, uh, it will take into a, a 
a more of a uh, a linear approach. So it will take, you know, based on your historical revenue, what is the predictive amount of revenue you could make? Um, it will look at, you know, a minimum amount of revenue versus a maximum amount of revenue. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. So it, it takes in your revenue, uh, whatever statistic that you find as profitable. You know, I've heard sometimes like burger chains come to us and say, you know, we also consider another metric of high performance, like number of burgers sold. So can we do a model for revenue and can we do a model for number of burgers? Absolutely. Um, that's definitely, as long as you have that information ready to go, it can adjust in that machine learning model and, and start to run through that prediction. Fantastic. Great. I think we've probably got time for uh, one more question. Um, so we have a, a question from Guru Raj Joshi who asks, what are the geographic areas currently covered, covered uh, as each region has a different format of CPG trade formats covered? And also, uh, are models different by region and country? Um, not entirely sure on all, all of that question, but I think maybe just answering the, do the models change according to the territory that they're running in? Maybe asking answering that question could be helpful. Mm. So I think the, the models are all dependent on you know, what, of course, it's going to be changing on what data is being fed into it. So in this instance, we're seeing, you know, the United States of America, but we have pushed this uh, site selection tool out into Europe, out into, you know, parts of Asia. So it, it really is dependent on the data that we're inputting into it, as well as your data that's available. And yeah, it, it can change. And it's not dependent on the, the country per se, but it's the data that's going into it. Um, the analysis tools will still function the same. It's just this tailored fit model to your data sets and your demographics or you know, a third party data set. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and also like to, to add to that, like we, we have data sets uh, across the whole world. So the great thing is that we can go and, you know, go into our Cartos Data Observatory and take a similar data set that we have here in the US for AJS, we can find it in the UK, for example, or, or Spain or, or whatever, and just use this other data set to create the same models as performant as this one. Absolutely. And I think one interesting data set that we're starting to see used more and more is uh, the geosocial data. So if you're a CPG or a retailer and you're launching, uh, so we've seen restaurants who are launching just plant based restaurants now. So you want to go after the organic and plant-based vegan segment. Mm -hmm. There's actually being able to use social media data or MasterCard transaction data to understand where those segments are and to embed that within the algorithms involved in this analysis. It is becoming more commonplace. So um, loads of exciting use cases. Uh, Steph, Margaret, mm -hmm. thank you so much for walking us through them. If anyone would like to speak any more with Steph and Margaret, uh, we do have a, a booth available. Uh, you can reach out to them directly as well. Um, they'll share their, their